Okay, I'd like to welcome, uh, say welcome to all of our families who are joining us tonight for this live stream event. This is gonna be an exciting time here tonight as we get an opportunity to hear from our families. We're off to a great start of the school year. And although there have been some challenges along the way through leaning forward together, we will continue to address these challenges and do what is in the best interest of our students. I thank you to all the parents for being so patient and to all of our staff. The excitement around being back, learning in person and connecting with friends and teachers and staff is still front and center for all of us. The very first day, just seeing the excitement from our parents with the pre-K to kindergarten students and just seeing even the middle and the high school students was really just wonderful. Getting to this point has been a methodical process with our eyes on the metrics and our ears listening to our medical advisors and also paying attention to the science experts. We will continue to review and monitor data from public health and CDC to ensure all of us remain healthy and safe. I would also like to say, as we move forward, we have been thankful for the great support that we're continuing to get from our MTI uh, partners and also from our uh, medical advisors and the APP. I wanna say thank you to everybody for the wonderful work that you're doing. We're working as partners here in Madison Metropolitan School District. Tonight, we're gonna be joined by our board president, Ms. Ali Moultrup. And at this time too, she have a few words for you. Ms. Moultrup, please. Good evening, everyone. We only have an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm gonna keep my comments brief. I want to acknowledge and welcome my fellow board member, Chris Gomez-Schmidt, who is joining me here today. It has been a long journey for our students, families, and communities, and we're grateful for the collaboration with families, our partners, and everyone who is represented here today. Like Dr. Jenkins mentioned a moment ago, it is truly an amazing feeling to know our scholars are able to have the opportunity to be back in the classroom learning in person. The school district is focused on doing all we can to stay together safely. Many of the issues we are going to talk about today are centered around maintaining our success in mitigating the spread of COVID-19 so that we are able to continue in-person learning. We also want to be sure we continue our collective energy and move forward together as a school community so every student has a safe and productive and successful school year. So let's get to why we are all here today, and that is to answer your questions for back to school. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I will now turn it over to our moderator, Liz Murfield. Liz? Thank you, Ali. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to be with you all again, as well as with you, Ali, Chris, Dr. Jenkins. Looking forward to a productive Q&A session. Uh, just before we get to questions, I just want to give a shout out to our interpreters making this session accessible to our Hmong and Spanish speaking families. So welcome to those of you joining Interpretation Zooms. So why don't we take our first questions? Okay, so we've got one um, pertaining to homecoming. So will all high schools have a homecoming dance is our first question. I'll take that question most definitely. At this point, we've had an opportunity to work with our metrics team, which have our medical advisors there and just other members that I mentioned earlier. And we have um, put forth a very safe way to have homecoming dances. And I'm very proud to say that the communication is going out, or has gone out right now to everyone, but also we lifted students' voices in this process. And I have to give uh, really the high school principals, along with their students and their staff, a lot of credit for pushing to see how could we remain safe and have uh, a homecoming dance. So yes, so thank you too for asking that question. That's been a big question over the last few days. Thanks, Dr. Jenkins. We have another one here about virtual learning options. Will they be available for the second semester? Somebody would like to know. Yes, we are planning for our virtual uh, learning to continue. Dr. McCray can speak to some of what we have right now in terms of with our six through 12, but also our pre-K through five. Uh, TJ is not with us. Uh, is there anyone else that can support uh, that? Well, I, can, 
I could go ahead and speak to it. I was just going to let them know that we're going to continue as we had started with our Madison Promise uh, program, and we're going to continue with that 6 through 12. If the question is about will individuals have an opportunity to enter or exit the program second semester, that is something that we're setting ourselves up as we've already had some individuals going to the virtual programs have decided to go back in person as they realize the mitigation strategies that we have in place. Yes. Thanks. Okay, switching gears a little bit uh, to talk about contact tracing. How does MMSD do contact tracing when um, a, a special education or cross, cross, oh, a special, excuse me, I think it's a specials teacher because the examples get, were given um, gym, music, art, et cetera, when they see um, every student. We're gonna have nurse Wendy uh, speak to this particular one about contact tracing. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. So contact tracing is done um, with our guidance from Dane County Public Health. And it's a very important process and it involves starting with the positive case. And during that process, the nurse or the health office staff is talking directly with that positive case and then any student or staff who had contact with that case. So it doesn't matter if the student went from a classroom to a classroom or what teachers had them, um, the contact tracing is completed. Um, with with anybody who had contact with that student. Thanks, Wendy. And if we could keep you up here for our next question, it has to do with contact tracing as well. Um, so this one is around busing. So the question is, um, how do we how do we contact trace um, for elementary school buses? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to lean on Leah, if you can help me. You betcha. So when we are thinking about our buses, we are thinking about the students who are within close proximity. So we use our same contact tracing standards. We think about who is within six feet, what was the quality of the masking, and then we follow our contact tracing process in general. So it is possible that students will have to quarantine as a result of a positive case on the bus, but it's our hope that it's only the students within the immediate proximity of that positive case. Thank you, Dr. Esser. Yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. And of course, if, if you've asked a question tonight and you have follow-up questions, our Let's Talk feature on our website is certainly open to everyone. And we invite you to ask your follow-up questions there and we'd be happy to get back to you with more information. Okay, vaccinations is the topic of the next question. Um, it has to do with teachers or um, more broadly staff. So the question is uh, why are teachers not required to get a vaccine? Why are teachers not required to get a vaccine? Well, well that's definitely. The, that's uh, the question, yeah. That was the question. Yeah. Currently, right now, we are too putting forth, uh, put forth to the board, and it's up for a discussion. And we've been working very collaborative on a process because the recommendation has been for all of our staff to be uh, required to get a vaccination. And right now, uh, we're working through the process. We're going to lay it out to the board. We've had some discussion about it, and we're really excited about what's coming up. Uh, I'll tell you a very positive note on the uh, staff, in particular with our teachers, according to uh, Mike Jones, our MTI, 85.5% of the teachers are saying, too, that they're in support of vaccination. Excellent. So I know we have some folks on the Zoom who can speak to this. It's about uh, virtual instruction. So there are various scenarios uh, under which a student might be sent home to learn virtually. So perhaps they have tested positive and are isolating. Perhaps they've been a close contact to someone who's tested positive for COVID-19 and they're quarantining. Or in some cases, their, cat, their classroom might be closed, even though they might not be a close contact. And so what does instruction look like for these students? So uh, this, this person would like to know, have there been thoughts about having teachers turn on Zoom in their classroom when kids are out, not to do concurrent teaching, um, but at least to have kids who may be in quarantine or learning from home 
um, be able to listen into the classroom. And I know we've problem solved around a few of these issues lately with our instructional folks. So um, if, if Dr. Jenkins, you'd like to call on someone to talk about that, we can- Let's start out at the elementary level and uh, with Ms. Stanford, and then we'll have Ms. Jackson follow up with that. Good evening, everyone. Yes, this is part of the conversation that we are having. How do we continue to keep students connected to their classrooms? Because we do understand the importance of the relationships um, when they do have to be out for um, quarantine or if they're out um, because they are positive. I'll hand it over to Kaylee. Thank you, Ms. Stanford. Yes, uh, what we are doing is making sure that students are still connected and that they are still receiving access to high quality rigorous instruction. So what students will be accessing while they are um, in quarantine are lessons that were written by the curriculum and instruction team that is available via website. Um, we are also ensuring at this point that families and students are being contacted um, by teachers and staff within the building at least once every other day to ensure that feedback is being provided on those lessons. Thank you for that, Ms. Stanford and uh, Ms. Jackson. Also, uh, Dr. Esser, could you, Nurse uh, Wendy, speak to how long our students are out when they're quarantined once they have to go and get assessed for the test? Yeah, I'm going to let Nurse Wendy take that one from the nursing health perspective. She is our expert. Go ahead. Yes, so thank you. Um, so if a student is quarantined mm -hmm. and they are willing and able to get tested and that would testing would occur at day six or seven after the exposure, if that test is negative, the quarantine can end and they can return to school on um, after day seven of quarantine. If the student is um, unwilling or unable to get tested, then we will quarantine for the full 10 days and they can return to school at the end of those 10 days pending they are asymptomatic, so without symptoms. And I was just asked a question today too, Nurse Wendy, about how long does it actually take to get the results back uh, once we send those out? And so uh, we had a conversation about exact sciences. Uh, so if you speak to that. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think to recognize that we are MMSD is a piece of this puzzle for testing and with COVID. So um, we are collaborating with COVID Clinic, who is a vendor who completes our testing. COVID Clinic sends our tests to Exact Sciences, who does they're the lab that does the testing. And they are partnered with Department of Health. And so delays have occurred when we have had um, high volumes at exact sciences. So for an example, one weekend they had over 20,000 tests that they needed to run. Um, so delays have occurred when there has been extremely high test volume or when there have been technology delays on the state side. And so I think I appreciate the challenges when there are test delays, um, but I think to recognize that we are one piece in the system. And I know Dr. DeMurray has mentioned that um, this is something they're seeing kind of statewide, um, just kind of delays with all of these testing results. Thank you so much, Nurse Smith. That's helpful. Okay, so uh, Dr. Esser, um, Nurse Smith, I think you're humans of the hour here tonight. We have, um, we have some other questions for you. And I know that this is on a lot of parents' minds and I completely understand the, the desire to have this. I do also know that it's a little bit nuanced and complex. So this is about um, kind of threshold. So I know a lot of folks are wondering like, okay, what is the point that you are going to close a classroom? What's the, what are, what's the number that you're going to close a school? Is it a certain percentage of students who have tested positive? Is it, is it in school transmission? Um, what do the numbers have to be is the question. And um, Dr. Osari, I know you could probably lead us off on this. Sure can, of course, I'd be happy to. This is an excellent question and something that um, we have been preparing um, materials to release to our community to help better understand our thinking here so that you can forecast um, uh, your world moving forward. So you can anticipate in, in the uh, sometime next week this written um, uh, and shared with families. But I can give you just a brief overview at this point to help contextualize when we would close a classroom, a school or the district. Typically what our, our approach is really um, through 
intentional contact tracing. And so our idea is, and what we've been very successful in doing thus far, is that we quarantine the least amount of people possible. So we look at who were the close contacts and those um, individual students or staff are in quarantine based on a variety of factors um, that would determine that they are um, not eligible to be at school. Um, in that event, that's when those particular students uh, or that small group of students would uh, engage in um, asynchronous learning, as Kaylee talked about a little bit earlier. They would have online opportunities to access learning through their time of quarantine. That's our ideal scenario. There are times where we have to close a classroom or a cohort of students. Um, when we are approaching a threshold of more than half of the class, that is in quarantine or isolation, we are looking to shift to virtual for a period of time. Um, this means that all students would log in via Zoom as they did last school year. This would be for the period um, of, of quarantine for that particular class or cohort. At middle and high schools, that becomes more complex. Um, some middle schools are cohorted. And so if that were the case, we would proceed thinking um, through that scenario from the lens of a cohorted group. Um, at our high schools, however, it's, it's much less common for, for students to be cohorted. And instead, what we would look at is individual quarantines and asynchronous instruction for those folks that were deemed close contacts in that situation. It is not possible, um, truly, to provide a concrete threshold or an exact um, explanation of when we would close a school or the district. There are a variety of complex factors that would require consultation with Dr. Jenkins and our senior team and cabinet, our health experts and public health. It would be a big decision that would require the analysis of a variety of factors. Those factors may include um, orders from public health, active number of cases in Dane County, active number of cases within a school, rate of transmission or concern about, um, about community spread, absences among staff or students, um, school-wide uh, need, uh, district-wide need to do contact tracing and a variety of other metrics um, that may be relevant at the time. So while I know that there is a desire um, at, from our community to have a concrete threshold, it truly is um, a case-by-case a -case basis and we have to be thinking through a variety of complex factors using science and data to guide us. Thank you so much. I think we touched on buses earlier, if memory serves, um, but I know this has been a, a bit of a, a tricky issue. So when there's a positive case on a bus, folks are wondering how we determine who was in, um, who was the close contact of a positive case on a bus. I can jump in here um, and, and take this question. Um, buses are something that, that continue to come up in our in our conversations in our community. So I also just want to um, acknowledge um, that we are we're always reflecting on our processes and procedures and thinking about how we can be mo most effective in ensuring safety and mitigation. So like everything, um, we are thinking about um, how we have layered uh, mitigation strategies that are on the bus so that we can prevent students from being close contacts. So when it comes down to it with buses, the key really is to, um, to avoid close contacts. Um, that being said, we do have to acknowledge that we have students sitting, um, multiple students per seat, and there are some unavoidable close contacts on the bus um, that we have to navigate and, um, and deal with as a result. Liz, did I answer that question in its entirety? I, I might have drifted a little. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, switching gears. Let's let's go to let's go to HR and staffing as a topic. Um, so substitutes. So how are how is MS uh, how is MMSD supporting teachers with uh, a substitute shortage? I tell you, we have a variety of things that we're doing here, and I'm going to first of all talk about uh, have the elementary uh, Ms. Stanford speak to this, and uh, Mr. Harvey. And then we'll have the others speak to it as well. Good evening again. Thank you, Dr. So, Jenkins. Um, go ahead, Mr. Harvey. 
So currently we're developing a plan looking, looking across all departments to provide some support to see how can we lean, uh, lean in with the schools to provide additional support. I would also just add that we know that this is a nationwide issue and it's not anything that's unique to MMSD. And so we are continuing to recruit um, to be sure that we are getting viable candidates to be able to fill our positions. And that's really pretty much it across the board. And right now, uh, we've been very uh, fortunate not wanting to uh, strain on our schools, but at the individual school level, they have been providing substitute. And sometimes administrators have even been going in and teaching uh, when needed. But it is a shortage at this point. And for the most part, uh, we're, we're responding uh, the best we can with this. But if you know any substitutes out there, anyone who uh, may be retired or not retired and looking to substitute, we're looking for individuals to sub. Absolutely. Okay, so on this next topic, I'm wondering, Dr. Jenkins, I know we have a few of our medical experts um, on call here, and so this might be a good opportunity for them to weigh in. The question is, does MMSD have any plans for implementing routine screening testing testing for COVID uh, to try to identify cases and potential outbreaks as early as possible. Um, the person asking the question cites that this is a recommendation by the Centers for Disease Control and many experts. I know Dr. Friedrich is with us at, um, in addition to others. So um, the, the question is around routine screening testing for COVID. Yes, we will have our medical advisors weigh in. We're constantly weighing this together, but we will have our uh, medical advisors just weigh in on this topic. Sure, I'm glad to, to talk about that a little bit. So, so I think there are a few issues here. And, and first is that, that screening definitely can play a role, uh, which is why CDC has recommended it as an option. And it's, it's something that we've discussed internally um, you know, on our, our uh, advisory meetings. But so far, we've recommended against uh, implementing screening in Madison for a couple of reasons. The first is that in order for screening to be effective, uh, you have to have results really rapidly. And as we've already heard, there have been some issues uh, as we start to, to roll out testing uh, through these, uh, these third party vendors across the state, not being able to guarantee results fast enough for them to be meaningful for screening purposes. Um, the second is that in order to, to do screening, you have to test everybody very frequently. And so the, the, you have to have the capacity to do a much larger volume of, of rapid testing than we're currently able to do with the, the services that are available to us. Um, and then the third reason that, that led us to, to have a bit of pause is that we actually did a study in the fall um, here at UW-Madison evaluating the, the availability of um, multiple times per week screening um, on the ability to, to control outbreaks. And we saw that it wasn't perfect. And sometimes it seems like screening, um, the availability of screening can affect people's behavior and make them um, maybe back off on some of the risk mitigation strategies that are most important for, for keeping everyone safe. And so the, the most important thing we can do is, is to, to keep up masking and distancing where available um, to, to keep uh, transmission to a minimum. And so I think if the, the landscape around testing were to change, then we're ready to reevaluate uh, the potential for screening. Thank you, Dr. Friedrich. Thank you. Okay, um, so what are we doing for families who have medically fragile family members um, and whose children did not get into a virtual learning? So we have at the secondary level, we have a virtual Madison Promise Virtual Academy, and then we have a virtual option at the elementary school. So what are we doing for families who have medically fragile family members um, whose children are learning in person? That's actually a great question. And that was also part of us expanding the opportunities for more individuals to take part in the pre-K through five uh, virtual school. We initially had it set up for 150 families and in a, like a day and a half, there were over 700 plus responses. So we increased it, but increasing it. And there was also increased, as we know, the Delta II variant rapid picking up in a number of cases. So we tried to expand it so more of our families could have an opportunity 
But uh, right now, we've also seen, even though there were 700 and some families indicated, uh, we're still up pretty high in the rough near 600, but there have been some families chose that virtual option and now they're going back in person once they've seen the mitigation strategies that we do have in place right now. Okay, we're gonna talk about um, literacy for a change. What's the strategy behind implementing the letters program? I'm going to have Ms. Jackson talk about this in a second, but right now we have the early literacy uh, and beyond emphasis that we're doing a partnership, first of all, with UW, talking about just the whole influence of early literacy and beyond. But in our district, we've chosen letters, uh, which we have closely looked at the science of reading and understand what letters bring to us in terms of our foundational knowledge uh, beyond just a phonemic awareness and phonological awareness in terms of giving a systematic response to how you increase uh, reading in your district. But we're also looking at the middle level and looking at the high school, what we need to do. One of the things that we understand right now, just from talking to our teachers, talking to administrators, uh, and just hearing from everyone, uh, how we implemented letters coming into this year, understanding that there are so many things going on. We're working together right now to get a cadence to where we can partner in doing this because we're in this for the long term, not just for the short term, but we know that this is a viable systemic approach to increasing uh, our students' uh, early literacy and uh, and beyond. So Ms. Jackson, if you wanna speak to what we're doing with it, or uh, Dr. Gabi. Wonderful, Dr. Jenkins, thank you so much. Yes to everything that he said, and I'll speak a little bit more to the specifics. So for letters, we are training um, our teachers 4K through six, as well as our ninth grade teachers this year in letters. Um, one of the things that we have um, learned throughout our implementation of letters um, is that we really wanna be sure that we are leaning into humanity and that we are creating enough time and space for our educators to truly uh, lean into um, um, this, this early literacy piece. And so with that, um, we are going to be building um, a, a, lit a letters implementation review committee uh, with, with uh, cross-functional team members from all of our feeder patterns so that we can really look at and be sure that we are um, creating a plan that is systemic and a plan that is truly going to result in long lasting um, results. Uh, as a team, we have actually met uh, just recently with Dr. Motes who is one of the co-authors of letters, specifically around implementation of letters in our high school setting. Um, and she has agreed to work collaboratively alongside with us as we uh, really adapt our approach to be sure that it is um, personalized for our high school um, and the data that we are showing in our district. And I'll say to that, thank you so much, Ms. Jackson. We heard from our staff about it. And so as a result, and I wanna thank to our principals and thank uh, MTI for their collaboration in this and bringing forth to us where some of the challenges are. We're still in the midst of a full pandemic. And as we're leaning in together, trying to make sure we increase in learning, we wanna make sure, as Ms. Jackson said, we are uh, protecting the humanity of not only our students, but our staff and the social, emotional, mental health as we begin to continue, as we continue in this work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Keely. So I love this next question. Um, and it's it's a really interesting question because I understand um, when if you're if you are a parent of a student who receives a notification that your student was a close contact, for example, or there was a case within your school, it can be really panic inducing and anxiety inducing. And so um, it can seem like maybe there's this like spread or outbreaks in our schools versus, you know, potentially folks bring it in from the community and, and then there are cases. And so I like this opportunity to um, respond to this question, which is, are the positive cases within schools spreading in the classroom or spreading in the schools? Or does it seem like people are getting it outside of school? That's an excellent question. And thank you for asking that. Um, our contact traces are telling us to a very, very large degree, almost entirely, um, 
cases are are being um, are happening in the community. So it's the kids that go to the birthday party together or the families who are best friends and hang out together. We are also seeing that Delta is um, uh, hitting um, families significantly, whereas in the past, maybe one person or a couple people would get sick. Um, Delta seems to be, from our contact tracers perspective, taking out um, full family units and, and they're all testing positive. So we are seeing the transmission happen in homes and communities. What you are seeing at school is an abundance of caution. We do not have outbreaks at school, nor do we have evidence of spread. What we do have is careful and rigorous and thoughtful contact tracing that makes sure that we quarantine students who were close contacts who have any possibility of testing positive. Um, I also want to um, offer the opportunity for Dr. Friedrich to share his thoughts from the medical perspective. Um, but certainly we are feeling very confident that we're not having outbreaks at school. And what you are seeing when we're closing classrooms or quarantining students is an abundance of caution and, and thoughtful, thoughtful care on behalf of our students' health and safety and our staff health and safety. So thanks, Dr. Esser. And I can just add quickly that, that you know, studies from, um, you know, from CDC and others that have looked at outbreaks that were tied to schools, whether it was Delta or before, suggest that when there is transmission in schools, that that almost always is associated with, with times when people aren't good at keeping up with masking and distancing and other risk mitigation strategies. And so a reason why, you know, we, we want to really focus on doing the best we can to, to keep masking and distancing in place, especially when there are times when, you know, people are eating or, or doing other things that might be high risk activities um, to, as we can um, keep up that, those risk mitigation strategies, that's what's going to keep transmission down in the schools. And the, the data from CDC and elsewhere reported from other school outbreaks supports that idea. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Friedrichs and Dr. Esser as well, because that's definitely a question that's been coming up from various individuals. Okay, this is another great question. Let's 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 talk about mental health. This is a two-part question. Um, one is about mental health, and then one is a little bit about HR and staffing. What is MMSD doing to support the mental health of staff and students? Is the first part. The second part is. When will each school have a full-time social worker and psychologist? I think that's me again. Um, all right, uh, those are excellent questions. Uh, we have to acknowledge and recognize that we are still very much, as we have this conversation tonight, in the midst of a pandemic that is impacting our students and staff in a variety of ways, including um, an entirely different way of working and doing school. Um, with that acknowledgement in mind, we, we have to understand that the workload um, and the emotional load that teachers are taking on and the uh, rigor and expectations that we have of students are intense. So ensuring that the social emotional needs of our staff and students um, are met is paramount and prioritizing health and men mental health and wellness is a key strategy in ensuring our students are able to thrive at school and our staff are able to, to teach and learn in a safe and welcoming and enjoyable environment. As a district, we think about social emotional learning and prioritizing that as a foundation and supporting students and staff through intentional wellness and mindfulness activities. In addition, we do have mental health, direct mental health supports available for students at school, um, uh, including social workers and psychologists. Um, this question also asks about the allocation um, or the amount of time a psychologist or social worker is at a school. Depending on the size of a school and their needs, some schools are staffed at less than a full social worker or psychologist, but that is very rare in our district at this time. That being said, we are committed this year as we approach allocation season to be looking very critically at what the um, what the needs are of our school communities around um, social emotional learning behavior mental health and um, social emotional interventions and we'll be making very thoughtful and targeted um, the board of education around what we need in order to fully um, support our schools around uh, student services thank you don't go anywhere Dr. Esser, you're earning your paychecks tonight. I'm glad I told my mom to watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about COVID testing. 
So um, as many know, um, we have plans in place to offer uh, accessible free um, COVID testing at our school sites. And so this is an opportunity that was um, given to us by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services who um, assigned us a vendor and we've been uh, busy rolling that out and trying to make it go smoothly. So um, let's talk about that. What schools, the question is what schools are the COVID testing locations going to be set up at? All right, I'll start this question and then I may ask um, Dr. Friedrich to pop in as well um, related to overall um, COVID testing. I think this is, I think so. Uh, well, we'll see in the end. Um, so generally speaking, we are, as Wendy talked about earlier, partnering with COVID Clinic to have COVID testing on, on site at each of our buildings. We are working through some logistical um, some logistical pieces with their permanent structure so that the folks at COVID clinic have a place for you to come. Right now we're using tents and we're moving towards as the winter months come something more permanent. At this point we are in 10 schools with the hope of expanding to um, with the hope of expanding to um, more, uh, at least four more, and then hopefully throughout our district this semester. Um, we have to just acknowledge the fact that uh, expanding beyond the capacity of COVID clinic staffing um, just adds to the complexity. So we want to be thoughtful in the clinics that we open and make sure that they are available, open, and ready to serve students and families. We are in the process of building out a website that will be responsive to families so that they can go online and see what sites are open and what hours of operation um, those sites are available. I don't actually think Dr. Friedrich needs to jump in on this one. I jumped ahead. Um, and so I think you are off the hook, Dr. Friedrich. <laughs> For now. For now. For now. <laughs> well, let's see about the next question. Okay. So, okay. I know it's getting to feel like fall out there. It's getting a little bit chilly. I know I have my turtleneck sweater on tonight. Flu season is coming up. Um, so this, uh, this question is what systems will we put in place to keep the kids safe? Um, if the PCR tests aren't able to properly distinguish between the flu and COVID, um, how do you know which one they have so as not to incorrectly put a child into quarantine? And I, and I do believe that our medical experts may have something to, some insight to, sh to shed on uh, this question. Sure, I can talk a little bit about this. So I think it's a very good question. Um, and so every time somebody has the sniffles, like where the, the question is, is that COVID or is it something else? Um, the testing that we're talking about here provided by sort of through COVID clinic and then the testing that is done at Exact Sciences is a, a PCR test, as I think we've all heard about now. Um, this is a test that specifically looks for COVID. And so it can say yes or no, does somebody who has symptoms have COVID? Um, if it tests, if you test negative in that test, it, it can't tell you whether you have the flu or something else. It can just say that COVID is not present. And so this is why it's important to get tested if you're symptomatic, because it could basically exclude the possibility. It could rule out COVID, but it can't rule in something else once COVID is ruled out. Super helpful. Thank if you. I could just pile on that just a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, testing for flu and other viruses is um, generally not that useful in pediatrics. And uh, if it is something you need, you think you need, then it should be something you get from your healthcare provider. Um, there are very rare situations where it, it actually changes the care of a child, um, but um, generally we don't even do it in, in clinics. And it's, if your kid's symptomatic, then they, um, they need to stay home, um, even if they don't have COVID. Dr. Jamiri, appreciate you as always. Thank you for chiming in. All right, so some of you may have noticed um, um, many school districts throughout the state and the country have dashboards, public dashboards, where we report out on the number of positive COVID cases in our schools. We report on the number of close contacts and quarantine in our schools and ours, if you have not, you can find it at mmsd.org slash case count, one word, or if you would like to put a hyphen in between, you can get there as well. Um, the question is, how do cases get added to the tracker? I can take that. Um, our uh, COVID dashboard is updated once per week 
on Wednesdays, I believe, so that families can access and understand the number of cases um, of positive cases of COVID and to understand the number of close contacts that have been identified in the school. Um, the dashboard looks at a 14 day role, but it also looks at a more cumulative role, I believe, starting August 18th. Please keep in mind when you're looking at that, that that means that dashboard began before school began. Um, and so sometimes students weren't in school. So if you're wondering why you didn't hear about a case, it's entirely possible it's because it was before the school year started. Please also keep in mind that we are obligated to maintain student privacy. So if you see SPR, that means that the numbers are too um, low to report um, because it's possible we could provide uh, identifying information about a student and we have an obligation to keep that private. Yep, and I would add staff too. So we, we don't um, delineate between student and staff. So privacy is important to us regardless. So the numbers that you'll see there on that dashboard, may be students, they may be staff. Okay, teacher retention is the topic of our next discussion. This is important. What are we doing to retain teachers? This is, this is as we all know, a highly stressful and a difficult time for all of us. So how are we working to retain our, our valued um, educators? I'm gonna step in on this one and then I have others come in and also, uh... Mike Jones, you're on here if you want to speak up about this, but one of the things that we do know that we have to pay attention to the social emotional well being there's a national teacher shortage right now and there's an incredible amount of stress on teachers, but also on administrators during this time. And so we have talked about how we're going to continue to provide that support from Dr. Esther's office too, and having someone there available we have added uh, to our staff and we want to continue to add uh, in terms of the psychologist and mental support help that we have for them social emotional but one of the things that we find that's best we uh of having trying to create opportunities to have more dialogue about what are the real issues and as we just come out of a collaborative problem solving one of the things that's been very beneficial for me as a superintendent i have to get closer and hear our staff even more not just the teachers but the principals as well just met with them today and i think across the country as i'm talking to my colleagues this is a time we all have to lean in together and really try to pay attention and then respond to what are the needs uh, of not only just the students, but the adults as well. And uh, that's why I'll, I'll stop right there. Anyone else want to come in on that? Sure, I'll be happy to, to chime in. Um, good evening, folks. Uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, you recognizing that and everyone on this in this uh, space recognizing that. Dr. Jenkins, I think that, um, you know, some of these, one of the things that we've learned from COVID is that it's not that it exposes or creates new problems, but it exacerbates existing problems that are already in our system. We already were short, uh, whether we were talking about classroom teachers, uh, mental health and student support professionals, as was uh, brought up prior, um, education assistance, um, you know, uh, security, pretty much at, all the way to bus drivers, uh, food service workers, pretty much were short everywhere. But that that was not a that was this was not a new issue from uh, from from COVID or from the last 18, 19 months. This has been an issue in our district and in our country and in our community. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to to look at uh, the factors, not just the systemic factors in our district, but the systemic factors in our in our society where we are, um, you know, honestly devaluing education in so many ways to the point that uh, it becomes less and less of an incent uh, of a reason to get into this profession. Even if you had, uh, even if you graduated and you hired all the students that were at UW to become teachers, we still want to fill all the positions because um, it has be, become de-incentivized uh, as, a, as a profession and as a colleague. So I think um, one of the things hopefully we can come, come together on, and I know Dr. Jenkins, uh, I know uh, Ali and the board, I know everyone in this space are committed to, is how do we solve that problem, solve that issue, and actually recognize the humanity of everyone involved in the system. 
um, so that we aren't just tracking whether we're ta talking about our kids, our teachers, our employees, our workers. We're not tracking them as numbers and and uh, test results, but how are we seeing them as full fledged human beings um, that are bringing so much uh, positive value to our community? I think then we're going to be able to to really stem the tide and be be really a model district uh, for this for this country uh, if we come together and actually begin listening and being able to not only um, not only listen to uh, those who are in power, but those who are speaking that truth to power, uh, you know, in the, in the future. And I really appreciate you looking at too, uh, Mr. Jones, in terms of just everyone. Everyone doesn't just mean the individuals in the district, but this means our community leaning in, leaning in as well as we're gonna have to advocate uh, for public education and uh, all the positions that he just mentioned across the country, we're having shortages, but also we're just, just seeing the humanity in everyone. It's going to make it a better place for everyone and individuals inspired to come back to uh, and stay in education. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I agree. And it's always inspiring listening to you. I know since I met you, I think probably when you were out at Blackhawk, I've always really enjoyed hearing your perspective and working with you. So I'm, I'm happy to be collaborating with you um, around COVID-19. Um, we have talked a little bit about um, the possibility of mandatory staff vaccinations. Uh, others are interested in knowing about eligible students being vaccinated. So as we know, um, 12 and up, we've got eligible students, but potentially in the foreseeable future, we might be um, having students uh, as young as I think five years old being eligible. So the question is, is there a plan to mandate uh, that eligible kids uh, get vaccinated for COVID-19? This is a great question. I'm gonna have Dr. Demary speak right to it because he was at the regional superintendent's meeting when Mr. Goodman gave us the information. Dr. Demary, could you speak to that one? Sure. So in the case of uh, mandating vaccines um, for school children in the state of Wisconsin that falls under the purview of the Department of Health Services and the state legislature. So it's really not the, um, the schools don't have the legal authority to, to make that requirement. It has to come from DHS and um, via the power that they're given by the state legislature. Um, you know, we're all anxious to get the vaccine uh, for, for kids younger than 12. And we hope to hear something uh, fairly soon in the next month or two um, it's certainly up for consideration by the FDA. Um, meanwhile, I think it's really important that we um, encourage vaccination and um, we are offering um, you know, sites for vaccination um, and we continue to promote vaccine um, in, in all aspects of school. Um, it'll be really important when, it's, when we have a vaccine for younger children as well. In the meantime, we would like to encourage all adults who are eligible to be able to get the vaccine to get vaccinated because we do know that that's one of the best strategies for us to keep everyone safe. And our children right now cannot get vaccinated. We're under 12. And so that's why as a district, uh, I have taken it to the board and our board's discussing this and we're moving forward in a very collaborative fashion to keep us safe so that everyone who can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But thank you, Dr. DeMary, for that, because right in the state of Wisconsin, that's out of our rim right now of uh, influence. Thank you. And Dr. Demir, I think we 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 might um, might keep you up here for a second to talk about cafeterias. Um, uh, lunches are a concern. So why can't students eat lunch in the cafeteria while maintaining three feet of distance? Um, so they can socialize. Um, you know, kids want some normalcy in their day. Parents want some reassurance that their kids are having a normal, you know, uh, experience in school. Sure, it's a great question. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, and I think you know, it, there's a balance between that socialization that occurs and. Um, keeping infection control issues and mitigation strategies in place. Um, lunchtime uh, is one of the hardest uh, times of the day for us to maintain that, right? Because we have to take our masks off to eat. And this is a problem in, um, a, a, that a bunch of my colleagues are facing nationally as well. Um, it, the, the goal there is to keep kids as far as possible as you can, that's practical. 
um, and still space them out in a in an area where they can uh, have lunch. You know, we uh, unfortunately in Wisconsin we can't have lunch outside for very long, uh, and so we have to use other measures to to um, separate kids while they're eating and they have their masks off. It is a risky time period. It also is going to result in more quarantine because um, a kid who is exposed um, with that mask off is, is then going to be quarantined. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question here that, yeah, this is kind of near and dear to my heart. I know I have a, a, um, a young person in, in my life who fits in this category who I care about very much. So how is MMSD incorporating children with disabilities or sensory challenges into the educational experience in light of the fight against COVID? Dr. Mokin. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I can take this question. So the services that are being provided to students with an IEP is dependent on their needs. So if we have a scholar who is unable to consistently wear a mask, then the individuals who work with that scholar have additional PPE that they're able to wear, and the scholar is still included in activities and classes within their school. And Efforts, all efforts are made to support the student to either learn to wear a mask for safety of themselves and others, and or to support that scholar to learn social distancing, good hand washing, et cetera. We also have offered for scholars who have an IEP and also have a medical condition that makes them susceptible to more negative impacts of COVID, that the IEP team may determine that some or all of the services for that student may be provided virtually. So additional support with instruction in skills on how to remain safe and other adjustments to the IEP during this period of COVID. Thank you so much for that response, Dr. Mopenti, because one of the things that we always wanna do in our districts is make sure that we demonstrate true humanity towards all of our students and have an equitable learning experience. Thank you. Okay, moving on. So as we know, this is a very difficult time for all of us. How can our community best support our teachers, our staff and administrators at MMSD? Um, this commenter says that we appreciate what all of you are doing for our children and community. Well, I'll start off and then if uh, Ms. Moto, maybe you wanna start off there. You wanna speak to that? I think that's an incredibly thoughtful question, and I really appreciate you asking it and also the opportunity to speak to it. I think what it takes for our community to support our schools um, and our teachers and our young people and us as administrators right now is to really do everything in your power to contain COVID-19. So please get vaccinated. Please wear masks. Please continue to social distance. Please remember that we are relying on you to keep schools open. And thank you, Dr. Jenkins, for allowing me to speak to it. And I'll pass the, the metaphorical mic to you. Right. And then on our metrics team, we also have another board member who said every week, and that's... Uh, Board member Gomez Smith, uh, would you like to speak to that as well? She's been heavily involved with it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I would I would like to echo that um, our responsibilities individually and our actions individually impact um, what we are able to do in our schools and keeping our schools open and safe for our our students and our staff. So thank you to everyone. Um, who is um, working on that. And I wanna do a special shout out to our school nurses. Um, we're just doing a tremendous job right now um, with all of the, the testing and the contact tracing and the care that they are giving to our students and our staff. So um, thank you to everyone um, who is just doing a, such a tremendous job right now um, to keep our schools running. We really appreciate everyone. Yeah, no doubt. And to that question, let me say that was a very insightful question, because as a part of this whole thing, if nothing else come out of COVID, I hope that we continue to do this. And that's getting back and focusing on human decency. We're seeing people go across lines, socioeconomic lines, racial lines, gender lines, all of whatever, just to help out. 
Uh, so just recentering the humanity and what we're doing, you're doing that by asking this question. It's not about yourself. You ask the question about everyone else. And I ask that if you get a chance to just blow your horn when you go by a school, if you see a principal, thank them. They, the principals are going all out as our teachers are, our custodial staff, our food service people. As you heard earlier, we're short uh, across the country and a lot of things. But I do think we're right now just overflowing with the amount of love that's coming back to public education. So I want to thank you for your humanity in asking that particular question. That was a big question. Thank you. And with your permission, Dr. Jenkins, I'm interested in hearing um, Michael Jones's uh, perspective on this answer, if, if that's all right. Oh, most definitely. We're partners in this. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, one of the things I also wanna add is, um, you know, we have a lot of staff, and when I say staff, I'm not just talking classroom teachers that the parent might be in contact with, but we have education, uh, educational assistants, we have ESL, special education teachers. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who are in, in pain right now, trying to trying to make it through uh, their week or make it through the month, trying to create a, a really positive environment for our kids. And I think one of the things we need to recognize is um, let's not turn on that when we recognize people are doing their best, because uh, sometimes, you know, today's hero that we're clapping for tends to be someone that we're pointing fingers at down the road for everything that's ill in society. And I think we need to remember that, especially when we're talking about some of our, uh, you know, kind of bread and butter topics or when we're talking about uh, pushing back, you know, when we're talking about when I hear in the legislature is talking about, uh, you know, trying to do some sort of anti-critical race theory bill, what are families doing to, you know, come together to say, no, we are an anti-racist district like we say we are. Um, so that burden doesn't just fall on the teacher, whether or not their job falls on that. You know, when we're talking about referenda, you know, and and providing and funding the schools that our kids deserve, you know, are we going to look at that? Or are we going to just look at our our tax bills and say that's not um, that that shouldn't work for me? So I think one of the things I hope is like keep this positive energy when we're talking about all the things that our system needs, because in order to get the social workers and the psychologists and the nurses that we know we need when it comes to the classroom teachers that we know we're short on, when it comes to the bus drivers, that's going to require all of us chipping in even more than we already have. And I think I just want to kind of call that out because sometimes that doesn't get brought into this discussion. It's like, thank you, but no, I'm not going to pay for it. Or thank you. No, I'm not going to do, go that extra mile. And I think the more public support we get on those sort of things, the better environment we're going to create, not just for our children now, but our children in the future and our children's children and the legacy that we leave uh, long after uh, we exit this system. Powerful. Thank you, Brian, for saying that. Quick time check, Dr. Jenkins. We have, we're at 6.58, so we have two yeah. minutes. Do you think we have time for one more question or do we, would you like to close it out? Um, I think it's uh, it's pretty close there. We want to respect everyone's time. I also want to take this time to thank all of our medical advisors. People like this, our medical advisors, are people in the community who will continue to volunteer, our community partners. I just want to say thank you to you. You've been huge. We could not have made it through uh, these last 18 months. Uh, MSCR, Ms. Dyer, she's on here, one of our staffers too, just various people inside the district and outside the district. We're doing it in Madison and we're doing it in a way that I think we're gonna to continue to be uh, equitable as we're uh, approaching things. Maybe we don't move at the same pace as everyone, but we're gonna make sure that everyone gets across the finish line. During COVID-19, be assured that our goal is to return your child to you at home every day, safely, every day. We wanna lean forward, learn together, but we're also gonna to have to pivot at different times. And thank you for the humanity that you're showing towards us as we have your most precious jewels within our hands right now. And I'm humbled to be your superintendent and we're humbled to work for you in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz, great job tonight.